Greetings. How's this uh, audio sound? Greetings. Greetings. How's this, How's this uh, uh, audio, audio sound? Greetings. Greetings. How's this? Is this better? Awesome. Um, like I put on Twitter, uh, I'm not going to be chatting with people while I'm giving the talk. So this first hour or whatever is going to be non-interactive. Um, and then when I'm done, then I'll go into chat and we can have a have a spell of, of Q&A and shooting the shit and whatever about things. Uh, so yeah. Guten Abend, O'Hara. Oh, well, it's Morgan here, but, well, not Morgan for good drei Minuten. Watar. Bless. I'm going to give people a few more minutes, and then I'm going to dive right in, because this is going to be, uh, there's going to be a VOD, of this on Twitch, um, and then I'm going to put uh, put it up on YouTube for long-term stuff. Um, Sess is doing great. She's resting right now. She's in the closet. She uh, she likes to sleep there. Yes. Danke, Jacques. Just a couple more minutes, let people stream on in. How has Bannerlord been treating you, Josh, from Shales? Um, I haven't actually played it since that stream. I've been pretty busy. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've played anything since then. No, unfortunately. Well, Animal Crossing in, like, teeny, tiny amounts. Everyone I know that's playing Animal Crossing has accomplished much more in that game than I have. <laughs> uh, Mordedil, just kind of off topic, did I start learning German as a hobby or work-related? I started learning German in college because my... Um, initially started as a vocal performance music major um, and then a history major and I was focusing on early modern Germany and so Latin and German were the languages uh, that people wrote things in around that time so Dr. Scuttles uh, hey Josh was your new Vegas talk do say the right thing ever available to watch online anywhere yeah I think that GDC made it available in the vault for a while. Maybe it might be on YouTube now. I'll be complaining about that at the end of the talk. Thanks for coming by, Odnan Ref. All right, I'm just going to let Twitter know that it's happening. And then I'll dive in. Just a second. Can I crank the volume just a tiny bit? Um, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm sorry. It's only because for whatever reason, XSplit is really sensitive to, um, I don't know. 
XSplit has been weirder with audio stuff than OBS. So I'm just going to leave it alone. I apologize. Oh, it is up on YouTube. Hi, Infinitron. Welcome. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. We got ew, 163. That's a lot of people. All right, I'm just gonna dive right in. Again, I am not going to be looking at or interacting. <laughs> uh, just a second. I'm just going to jump right in. I think, I think 181 people are good. So again, I'm not gonna talk to people or look at chat or respond to things in chat. I'm just going to give my talk, and then at the end, I'll go back, and uh, yeah, we can have a hoot nanny about conversation stuff. Cool. Here we go. All right, so this is my talk. It is called Reputation Overload, the Evolution of RPG Reputation Systems. Welcome. So... I would be surprised if you're watching this right now and don't know who I am, because I don't really know how else you would have gotten here. Um, but for future generations who might watch this on YouTube, uh, I'm Josh Sawyer. Uh, I am a game designer and a game director, and I started at Black Isle Studios in 1999, where I worked most notably on Icewind Dale 1 as a junior designer, and then was the lead designer on Icewind Dale 2 and some canceled stuff that does not really matter. Uh, and then I worked at Obsidian Entertainment. Well, I worked at Midway for a little while, but whatever. Um, then I worked at Obsidian Entertainment starting in 2005. Uh, I was co-lead for Neverwinter Nights 2. I was the lead designer and project director for Fall at New Vegas. And I directed both Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2. Um, I almost entirely have worked on role-playing games, specifically Western-style role-playing games, generally inspired by tabletop games. Um, so like D&D &D and groups and things like that. And my focus has been system design, narrative design, which is writing, but also things associated with writing and scripting writing um, and reputation mechanics and game direction overall. So what in the world is this talk about? Specifically, it's about reputation mechanics in Western-style role-playing games. Uh, I'm going to be talking about games that are mostly focused on the PC. Uh, there is some console overlap, but it's it's really about sort of the, the PC tradition of uh, reputation mechanics in those games. How they've changed from the early 90s until now, according to me, obviously I only know what I've seen and played. Uh, there are going to be examples that I'm skipping over for time. So please forgive me. It's not because I think they're bad or stupid. I'm just, there's only so much time. Uh, and also, things that started as tools to aid designers became a burden, at least in the games that I've worked on, because it's my fault. And we'll, we'll talk all about that. Um, so what are reputation mechanics for? This sort of seems obvious, but I think it's important to kind of break down the reason why these things exist at all. <clears throat> So they're for reactivity, but that's not really all that they're for. Um, they're abstracted reactivity. Um, so we can do choice and consequence in a number of ways. We can hand script it, and I can have you complete a quest, and then when you're done with the quest, a person will do something else, and you do it a different way. Another character reacts in a different way. That's just hand scripted reactivity. Um, abstracted reactivity is a way to make all the smaller choices that a player makes aggregate up into larger world reactivity. So the, the analogy I use for this is marbles in a jar. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you folks have had a teacher uh, or maybe a parent who tries to discipline a class or group of people by saying, if you behave well, I will put marbles in this jar. And when you hit the tape mark or the top of the jar, then we'll do something fun. Um, and maybe there are even multiple grades that you go through. Um, and sometimes you get no marbles because you're being bad, and sometimes uh, you get marbles taken out because you're awful. 
Um, but this is the same concept. It doesn't really matter how the marbles got in the jar in the first place. You just understand that it's good behavior that adds up to a reaction in the end. So that's what reputation mechanics are really for. It's a way to aggregate small things that you do or large things that you do into a larger global reaction. So it's a way to work around the limitations of hand scripting choice and consequence. Any of you who've worked on games uh, or even dabbled in it, you know that if you try to go really wild in um, reacting to reactions and having a big interconnected web of reactivity, it gets overwhelmingly complicated. Uh, reputations are a way to kind of abstract that and still make it feel like the world is reacting to what you're doing as a player. So again, they combine an abstracted mechanical system, the marbles in the jar, with mechanical and scripted reactivity. Meaning, once you hit a certain threshold, people respond to you in a different way, quests open up, quests can be resolved in a different way, etc. So, the first game that I played uh, that gave me some contact with reputation was Darklands. Um, Darklands is a game that not a lot of people know about. So uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about it. It was made by Microprose in 1992. It's party based and open world. Uh, but it's not open world like first person. It's, uh, it's a little weird. And I'll, well, not weird. It's just unusual. So I'll get into it in a bit. Uh, it was set in 15th century Germany, Greater Germany, or Holy Roman Empire. Um, and it had fame as a global reputation. And then it had local reputations in cities. There were about 90 cities in the game. I think there might have been slightly more than that. It was a lot, but they all had a common format, which made it easy for there to be 90 cities in a game made in 1992. By the way, this was a big game at the time. Um, so 90 cities with a lot of commonalities between them in terms of how illustrations were done, uh, narration was done, very large. Um, most of the navigation at locations was accomplished using choose your own adventure style sequences, which I'll get to in a minute. So you would explore the overland world map, uh, just kind of like you would in a game like Deadfire or Fallout. And then when you got to cities or, or a lot of places where you weren't fighting, um, you would explore through navigating choose your own adventure sequences. And the reactivity was scripted, but it was largely a, um, it was global. So like all the stuff that you would do in cities that were had scripted reactivity, that stuff was reused from city to city to city all over the world. So here's an example sort of of how the exploration system worked. So you would come to a location, you would have a watercolor sort of Im watercolor style image pop up, and then it would give you a number of options for where to go and what to do. Um, if you were in a challenging situation, you might be asked if you wanted to use a skill or attack or pray to a saint or alchemy or whatever, but it's the same kind of concept that you see in the scripted interactions in games like Pillars of Eternity or King of Dragon Pass, stuff like that. So you have this way of exploring the world, and then reputation would sometimes come up in these interactions, uh, and reputation, as you can see on the right-hand image, there's fame, which is global, and it wasn't used that often, and then down below you can see something that says local rep, and it says a local hero, 87. So each one of those little, I know it's hard to see. By the way, this game was 320 by 200, so I scaled it up to 640, 400, and then whatever. But each one of those little dots is a city or town that has its own reputation that you can raise or lower through your actions. Um, and how people react to you in that town is based off of that local rep. So one of the big things in the game is that a lot of the best, most rewarding quests you received through uh, commissions from powerful individuals. It could be the people running the town. Often though, it was the Fuggers and the Medici. And they would, um, they would basically either approach you or you could approach them based off of your reputation. They would either reject your appeal to see them for work or they would solicit work from you. And often it paid really well. Um, so this is one of the reasons why you really wanted reputation to keep going up in all the towns you went to because the more, the higher reputation you got, the better commissions you would get, and then the more money you would make, and the better your reputation would get, and so on, and it just sort of chained. And you could do that from town to town to town. Um, in addition to all the sort of procedural things like killing thieves that you could do to raise your reputation, there were other mechanics like praying to saints that were associated with, um, like St. Matthew is associated with bankers and bookkeepers. So if you pray to him, you can increase your rep. Reputation felt very impactful in these games, 
because it was tied to quests and rewards. Another thing that would come up if you had a negative reputation is how you got into and out of towns and cities. So all towns and cities, um, you had to, well, you had to get in and get out of them. The easiest way was to go through the gates, but if you had a bad reputation, you could be arrested or attacked by the guards. Um, so something really bad would happen and you would either have to run away or you'd have to try to find a way to sneak into town. So there were ways that you could use, again, in these choose your own adventure sequences, climbing over walls, sneaking in after dark. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and it really made a lot of new gameplay routes available to you, which is cool. So there are some pros and cons to this, as far as I'm concerned, and then we'll move on from Darklands. Uh, the systems are relatively simple and easy to understand. Um, you, it would always tell you when your reputation was increasing, and you could see that score pretty easily in the town that you're in. Um, fame was a little more abstracted, but it didn't come up that much, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, it was hand scripted, but the instances repeat all over the place. So once the designers actually scripted it, you know whether it was whether you were in Cologne or in Munich or Augsburg, you could reuse all those checks over and over again, and it felt totally fine. And it allowed for different behavior in different parts of the world. So if you if you were in Ulm and you did something super atrocious and you had a terrible reputation, just go somewhere else. Go up to Mainz. <laughs> go up to Bramberg or something, and you can just start over again. And it opened new content via missions, or in the case of a negative rep, new gameplay, which was infiltration or exfiltration. But on the downside, it did get pretty repetitive and generic because all towns essentially use the same system. All right. So I'm sure there are games that had reputation mechanics in between uh, Darklands and Fallout 1, but uh, I'm skipping right to Fallout 1 because that's when I remember this stuff getting used more. So Fallout 1 and 2 both had a karma system. So Fallout is protagonist focused, so it's really the actions of you as the, the main character. Karma was called general reputation, but the concept of it was very much like karma, like you do bad things and the world kind of responds to you as a bad person. The reactions were largely scripted to specific instances. Um, so, you know, it wasn't really procedural, it was more hand-scripted reactivity. Uh, and one of the biggest things in Fallout 1, especially, is that there were karma-specific endings. Um, this was, for me at the time, it was a big deal because uh, I hadn't seen anything like that. And so the ending of Fallout 1, I think, is the, I think it's the best ending of any Fallout game. <laughs> one of the best endings of any game. It's very surprising and cool and thematically appropriate. But it will change based on whether you are have a positive or a negative karma. And uh, it's, a, it's a small change, but it's a very shocking change. So I remember when I played this in college, I was like, holy crap, I got I to gotta go get a negative karma and come back and see how this ends. It's very cool. So pros and cons of karma. Um, again, it's a simple system. It's relatively easy to understand. Karma as a concept can be a little more abstract than reputation. Um, one thing that comes up with reputation systems is how do people know this thing? And you can get very simulative with it as a developer, which can be very complicated, meaning the idea of someone has to observe it and that someone has to survive to pass it on to other people. Um, that's a little complicated. When it's karma, it's a little easier to say like, you are bad, everybody knows you're bad. You are good, everybody knows you're good, it's okay. Um, the end game reactivity was extremely impactful. Granted, that's just, it's a small thing, but at the time, I think we kind of take for granted now, uh, you know, variable endings. Uh, at this time, there weren't a ton of them that I remember, and Fallout was very uh, memorable from my perspective. Karma does strongly encourage you to push in one direction and stick with it. Um, neutral karma is kind of like having no karma. So... If you're a mix of good and bad, it doesn't feel particularly rewarding because it all just kind of washes out, more or less. Um, so compare this to Paragon Renegade and Mass Effect, which were two separate scales and could be checked independently. Uh, obviously, Mass Effect came out much later than Fallout, but uh, it's worth mentioning. <clears throat> so now, Fallout 2 Karma and Reputation. So Fallout 2 split karma and reputation. So reputations are basically local, and karma re remains the global thing. 
Um, so again, you had local reactivity to the things that you did with scripted reactivity and barks. And barks are a very cheap way to get reactivity to a lot of things. Um, barks are the term that we use at Obsidian for one-off lines that usually minor NPCs, townsfolk, will give to you when you walk up to them and click on them or when you walk by them. Barks are just a way of them sort of acknowledging your presence, and if you have a reputation, they acknowledge your reputation. Um, Fallout 2 especially had a lot of these in, like, New Reno. I know Chris Avalon wrote a ton of barks, uh, which is really cool. Um, and barks are a good way to leverage reputation in a local area. Uh, they don't feel repetitive. Um, they feel very reactive, and especially if you have a lot of different areas, you get a lot of that stuff over the course of the game. Um, now, there were also special reputations, although these were more like perks and less like reputation, some of them, um, because they didn't get reacted to as much. Things like Berserker, Champion, Child Killer, Maid Man, Married, Sexpert, and Slaver. Those were more acknowledgments of things that you had done rather than things that, you, that came up in conversation, usually. But they felt cool. Um, and then you also had Karma and Reputation titles, which were a way of um, sort of showing the tape marks on, on the jar, so to speak. So rather than just having a number, you would hit certain thresholds that would flip over into, ah, now you're a defender, now you're a betrayer, now you're idolized, now you're vilified, which is cool to have something a little more concrete so the player knows when they're flipping over to the next sort of threshold of reactivity. All right. So, uh, Fallout 2 Karma and Reputation, um, they have pros and cons like anything else. So, localized reputations felt less disconnected than Karma. It wasn't an abstracted thing, it was more rooted in the specific locations. Um, special reputations had special recognition for those events, which was cool. So, if you got Prize Fighter, that was acknowledging the things that you had done, and that felt very cool. Um, the problem that I still had here, again, which Mass Effect solved later, and Fallout New Vegas also did, which is that a single scale that goes up and down, um, basically unknown is the same as mixed, which doesn't feel great. And not long after Fallout came out, uh, Baldur's Gate came out, and Baldur's Gate also had a reputation system. It was a 1 to 20 scale, so it wasn't positive negative, it was 1 to 20. Um, your alignment determined starting reputation, so if you started evil, you would start with a like an 8 or a 9. And then if you started good, you would start with an 11 or a 12, something like that. So it started as a starting point. Um, it changed based on a wide variety of things, for example, crimes and quests, uh, which were sort of myriad throughout the world. There were lots of little and big things you could do to change your reputation. Uh, donating to temples was always a mechanical way where you could just dump money and dig yourself out of a hole if you could get to one. It influenced uh, quite a few dialogues. It influenced vendor prices pretty dramatically. Um, and of course, it can make good or evil aligned companions leave the party. So it was purely alignment based. Uh, also, if you get a very low reputation, it can spawn Flaming Fist hit squads, which were uh, something, something else, something to deal with. Uh, at low level, they were pretty tough. So there are pros and cons to this approach. Um, alignment preloading reputation sort of pushed you already in the direction that of like-minded companions. So if you were an evil character, it's not a stretch to say you're probably going to want evil companions. So it already kind of pushes you in that direction from the beginning. Uh, the donation system was a nice mechanical way to let you dig your way out of holes. Um, the unfortunate thing about this system, I think, is that there was a meta that sort of suggested that you should stay at a mid-high positive for maximum gameplay benefit. Um, mid-high positive meant that you would be getting uh, reaction bonuses and you would be getting um, vendor discounts that were fairly significant, but you weren't in danger of losing anyone in your party at all. Um, low reputations were really bad. Um, while evil characters would respond well to you, uh, you had lots of reaction penalties, and you had huge vendor penalties, uh, and Flaming Fist hit squads would come get you, and if you killed those Flaming Fist hit squads, that would further reduce your reputation, which was kind of a downward spiral. So uh, it didn't actually feel good to play evil because you just it just kind of mechanically was very bad. Or 
pretty bad. Obviously, you could still complete the game, but you were you're being pretty strongly penalized for it. All right. And now, Fall at New Vegas reputation and karma in that game. How's everyone doing? Doing okay? All right, cool. Awesome. Whoa, 352 people. Cool. Welcome. So, um, in this darn game, so karma did exist in Fall at New Vegas, but it wasn't really a focus of what we were doing with a lot of the reputation systems. We had four location uh, reputations, lo local reps, and then faction-specific reputations that spanned the world wherever the faction was. Um, they had independent positive and negative scales, which allowed you to have a mixed reputation. This was handy because if we wanted to check, as, uh, as designers, if we wanted to check just positive or just negative, we could do that. Also, if we wanted to see if you were mixed rather than just neutral, uh, that was something we could actually do. And we also had separate titles for mixed reputations rather than just um, you know zeroing it out into neutral. Reputation affects a lot of things in New Vegas. Um, dialogues, it uh, very critically gives access to faction quests. As a bonus, it can give access to the faction safe houses, which are pretty nice. And then, of course, companion attitudes. Some companions are very strongly aligned with one faction. Uh, for example, Boone is very strongly aligned with NCR. So if you have a very bad reputation with them, he is not happy. Um, it also makes certain factions hostile to you on site, um, which led us to create faction armor, which was a way for you to kind of get around that, <laughs> walk around in disguise and avoid avoid the people that would normally kill you on site. And then, yes, we also had hit squads. They were not quite as pernicious as the, the Flaming Fist, um, but they were ranger squads and legion assassins that would come and try to ambush you. So there are pros and cons to this as well. So the independent scales were nice because they allowed mixed reputations to exist separately from unknown. So if you did if you did genuinely do some good things and some bad things and it made sense for your character to roleplay that way, then your reputation was mixed and you had titles um, like Wild Child and Mixed and Soft-Hearted Devil and things like that. Um, because the faction reps were directly tied to the narrative, players cared a lot about it, at least with the main factions. Um, because they could see that they were directly tying into their progress with those factions. Um, and the disguises gave a gameplay workaround that felt pretty cool and immersive. It wasn't uh, the most robust system because we did it all through scripting. Thank you, Charlie Staples and Jorge Salgado for scripting all that stuff. Uh, there was no code support for faction disguises. It was all brute force done by our excellent designers. Um, but it was cool because you could dress up, and as long as you didn't trigger the spotters, you could kind of get away with it. Um, problem was that mixed reputations, while it's cool to be acknowledged for having a mixed reputation, sometimes it feels hard to write for. So acknowledging that was more difficult than simply making it exist. Karma felt vestigial, and it wasn't very well tuned. Um, this was the first project where we had the position of, not position, but the job of Karma Police. So it's not just a song by Radiohead. Um, Travis Stout, I believe, was the first Karma Police folk on uh, All at New Vegas, and he was given the responsibility of going through and checking where we made checks and karma adjustments and all these things. It's not, by the way, the next thing I'm going to say about it not being tuned well, it isn't his fault because the stuff that he was reviewing just wasn't it. So um, because karma was not a high priority for us. So we went through, we tuned stuff, and it didn't feel good. Um, the number of reputations we had to react to started to strain the team's ability to write for. Um, obviously, everyone did a very good job. I think they did an excellent job, but it was pushing the limits. And I didn't recognize it at the time, but I sure did after the next game. All right. So now we're going to talk about Deadfire <laughs> and how things got way too complicated. Everybody still doing so? Okay, okay. Awesome. 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 Okay, so reputations, dispositions, and topics. Um, I'm just skipping over Pillars of Eternity to get to Deadfire because it's the more messier one. I'm um, aware where I sort of realized, like, I shouldn't do this anymore. So there were four location and eight faction-specific reputations in Deadfire. That's pretty comparable to Fallout New Vegas. Not too bad so far. Uh... There were also companion-specific player reputations. 
and there are eight of them. Now, you might say, hey, wait, actually, there were seven. I did my math wrong. Whatever. Okay, all the math on this slide is wrong. Whatever. Um, but you might say, hey, didn't all the characters in Fallout New Vegas also have reputations? Not really. Um, not all companions needed to track a reputation with the player. And if they did so, it wasn't systemic. It was just on the global variables. So it wasn't a reputation system. It was just an internal tracking system written by the designers who wanted to use it for their characters. Very simple. Also, additionally, we had directional, meaning each way, uh, companion-specific companion reputations. So how Shodi felt about Adair and how Adair felt about Shodi. Those were two separate reputations, and they were also tracked. Um, there were dispositions. Dispositions were kind of like, almost like karma, but not really described like that. There are reputations for types of behavior that were less abstract than good and bad, but more like benevolent, cruel, diplomatic, aggressive. And they would add up over time, and then people would react to them. So there are positive and negative scales to every single one of these except for dispositions. So you're starting to get into a lot of data being thrown around. Um, and here's where things get really off the rails because we had something for companions called topics that were the main mechanic for influencing their attitudes. And this was a very high-minded idea that I had and uh, it didn't work very well. I would go so far as to say it's one of the least ships and companion topics. <laughs> Two of the most poor, like, they didn't work out. Anyway, let's get into why. So this is basically taking abstraction too far. And here's how it goes. So topics, the idea of topics is it's a tag that you can attach to any note of dialogue, a player note or a companion note, that uh, feeds into a companion reputation. So those tags can be things like racist, anti-religious, pro-valian, they're completely arbitrary. It's whatever you we have defined that the companions individually will care about. Then whenever a player or a companion line has that tag, all the companions are pulled to see how they feel about it. Um, and then if they feel good or they feel bad, they have a, a procedural reaction and dialogue, and then their uh, reputation gets adjusted until they hit a break point, and then they probably flip out or they say they love you or whatever they're supposed to do that we're scripted to do. So also, because this got very frequent and hard to track, every interaction, this is in a patch much later, was logged for players to review because players would sometimes be like, I don't, I don't have any idea how these companions got these attitudes, which is not good. So for example, like the fact that we needed a UI for this at all maybe suggests that it wasn't a great idea. So here you can see Aloff and the things that he is well disposed towards and not well disposed towards. Um, so he is anti-pride, he is pro-duty. Um, there's a lot of stuff here that you know you can go through and you can see how he's gonna react to it. Okay, fair enough. Um, but I, like this reputation screen is a lot. Like there's a lot to look at, there's a lot to keep track of. You can see all the players' dispositions at the bottom. You can see all the faction relationships at the top all the companion relationships to you on the inner ring at the bottom. And then specifically here, we're looking at the relationship between the Watcher and Adair. So on the right, you can see these are all the lines that have triggered a relationship adjustment with Adair. That's, that's a lot of uh, visibility and documentation for something that should feel pretty natural. But the problem was it did not feel natural and it, it didn't work out. So the probably the most egregious example of this, which is where I realized I had done a, done a bad thing, was Shodi and Palagina's relationship in Deadfire. So um, Shodi was Megan Stark's character and Palagina was my character. And we discussed ahead of time, hey, I think Shodi and Palagina are probably not gonna get along because um, Shodi is religious. She's a priestess, in fact. Um, Palagina is extremely anti-religious. <laughs> she is easily the most anti-religious character in uh, the games, either game. Uh, when you first meet Palagina, her Act 1 companion hub has about 12 
Um, I couldn't open her dialogue, but I, it's about 12 anti-religious statements. And I mindlessly sort of tagged each one of those things as anti-religious because they're anti-religious. And what would happen, and this shipped like this, unfortunately, is that you could get Palagina in your party. You could say, hey, I want to talk to Palagina. You go into her hub, and then you could go ding, 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 ding. And Shodi would just go from neutral to burying the needle in max negative, like complete hatred <laughs> in one conversation. And logically, yes, Palagina tripped a bunch of uh, anti-religious statements, but it didn't feel good. It didn't feel natural. It didn't feel like players were like, what in the world just happened? So it completely worked the opposite of the way that it was supposed to. It was abstraction going too far. By the way, here's another side note, is just that we had this other tag, which was humor, which was maybe among the already ill-advised things of the topic system. Very bad, because humor is very specific to the individual. And you would have characters like Shodi and Adair who liked humor, but then the player could make this like really gallows humor joke about Ephesians dying or something, and they're like, oh. <laughs> oh, and they're like knee slapping and chuckling and their reputation or their like relationship with you gets better. And it just, it's a perfect example of how that abstraction just did not work. It didn't make any sense. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have been built like that. So dead fire reputations, dispositions, topics, pros and cons. So they're very specific. That's good. It's cool that they're very specific. They're highly reactive um, when, when we're able to actually get the time to write all the reactivity. Uh, the faction reputations were tied directly to the faction conflict in the narrative. That's like Fallout New Vegas. That was very good. So especially when it came to the four factions, the Valiant Trading Company, Royal Deadfire Company, the Juana and the Principe, like, players cared about those reputations because they impacted their relationships with them meaningfully in the story. But it was too much. Like, there was so much for designers to do in this game. So, in addition to... So, you already have a fantasy role-playing game with different races. You have male and female gender. You have all the different classes, all the different skills. We had backgrounds. We had reactivity to things from Pillars of Eternity 1. And then we had all the stuff that I just talked about. It was way too much for people to write for. It was just too much. Um, the dispositions in Pillars 1 and 2 felt too abstract for the reactivity that they triggered. Again, if you were honest five times in one city and then went 50 miles away, people would respond to you for being honest, and it felt like karma. Um, not in a good way. People did not have a good reaction to it. Um, and the topic system, as I already said, it was way too complex on the design side. And then on the player side, it often was just like, didn't make any sense at all. So complete disaster um, in terms of complexity and implementation. Uh, most companion relationships didn't even result in a lot of discord or harmony. Like they didn't have special relationships. So the system was really wasted on them. It was, uh, again, in Fallout New Vegas, there was nothing really wrong with hand scripting all the internal variables for how characters would react to things. Um, most players didn't feel like they weren't reactive enough. And for characters like Raul, who didn't react as much, he didn't need a system to track anything. So this was a, a very heavy, cumbersome system that didn't need to exist, arguably. So Disco Elysium reputation. Uh, everybody who writes... Oh no, I cut that off slightly. It's not reputatio. Reputatio. Um, no, it's reputation. So everybody who writes branching dialogue should absolutely play Disco Elysium for many, many reasons. Not only is it very well written, it's a very cool world. It has great dialogue, great prose. It's a, it's a great game. But also mechanically, they do um, some interesting and important things that are worth analyzing and maybe copying for the future. So here's why, in my opinion. What are we doing on time? Actually, I'm not doing too bad. Nice. So there were really like two reputation systems. There were hand-scripted tags, and there was the thought cabinet. So 
the tags were specific actions, specific things that you did that influenced mechanical skill check resolutions. So, and I'll get to the specificity of that. So you do a thing and then the character reacts to that, but that might sound like regular choice and consequence, but it's abstracted through a mechanical check. It's not literally a um, concrete reaction because you did something else. It's not A then B. Um, and then the thought cabinet represents ideas and ideals that you internalize um, so you basically start behaving a certain way. You could kind of think of it as dispositions, but just way better. <laughs> so you start behaving a certain way, and then your character starts thinking about certain things, or you have a conversation that makes you think about certain things, and then you can put that idea into a thought cabinet to define your character in that way. It's super cool. So these two folks you encounter pretty early on in the game, and... Uh, you can see the reactivity and how this works right away. So you, oops, whoop, wait, whoa, 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 okay, sorry. So in this check, there's a check that you can make here that is based off of empathy, but the check is also being influenced by two actions that you've taken. Um, and you can see exactly the mechanical input that they have. So it's a very direct uh, consequence but it's not that new content had to be created, it's that these are influencing the check that you're making later on, which is very cool, and you can see exactly how. Um, another conversation, again, not super far in the game. No, I have not completed this game yet. Do not give me shit about this stuff. Um, Cindy the Skull, so in the course of pursuing my, my artistic fantasies, um, I need some paint, and so I need to go and convince Cindy the Skull, who is an artist, to give me paint. Um, I've already talked to her about where she lives, and that makes it easier for me to have this conversation with her. Very cool. It's a very specific thing. It's called out in this check specifically, but it's a mechanical check. Um, if that didn't exist at all, I could still have a check here because it's checking against conceptualization. So it's very cool. Um, the thought cabinet is super duper cool. Um, you can see mechanically how this works here. So as you're going through the game, you start talking about artistic things, you start getting this artistic thought about having an actual art degree, um, being an art cop. So the idea is that you get this like an item and you can put it in your thought cabinet and then you think about it as you have conversations and time passes and eventually you, get, you, you complete the thought and then you can equip it in your thought cabinet and you actually get bonuses from it. And the bonuses are very thematic, which is cool. So for example, um, when you're thinking about the actual art degree, you have minus one perception because you can't look at any of the shit. Everything sucks. <laughs> Everything sucks, so you just can't look at anything. Um, and then when you complete your actual art degree, you have minus one hand-eye coordination. Now you can look at all the shit, but you're so angry about it that it, it makes you like literally shake, which is very funny. And then conceptualization passives heal you, which makes a lot of sense. It's very cool. So what are the pros and the cons of the hand-scripted tags? Um, the reactivity is localized to individual conversations, but it still feel, feels more directly connected. So it's abstracted, but only a little bit. It really still feels like it has an impact within the conversation. Um, the impact is abstracted by mechanics, but it's highly specific in the narrative. Great, great slide, Josh. Um, the consequences don't require new work. So if you were building out Kuno's dialogue and you wanted that reactivity in there, it's not that you had to make new reactivity, you had already designed the reactivity. What you're doing is you're saying this choice earlier in the conversation can impact this mechanical check in this way. So you just have to integrate it into the mechanics, which is not no, I shouldn't say it's no work. The mechanical integration is the work, but it's not a new choice and consequence scenario. But it is a lot of work <laughs> to do all of that because every single thing needs to be planned so in the same way that you plan out choice and consequence, you do have to plan out these hand-scripted tags and how they get called and referenced. You might say, well, how is that different from any other reputation? Well, let me let you in on a little secret. Um, a lot of times we can treat reputation as pennies in a jar. We can say, we know the player will have a reputation in Good Springs. We know there are good and bad things that you can do in Good Springs. We don't know exactly how we're going to react to that right now, but we can figure that out later. And that's that makes things flexible from a development perspective. You do need to plan more. For example, another game that I could have talked about and gone into, although it's more about scripted choice and consequence, is Alpha Protocol. Um, Alpha Protocol had a ton of planning. The narrative designers did a ton of great work. 
I'm thinking out all the choice and consequence in there. So if you contrast this with global, I just already said that, great job. Um, the slight disadvantage here is it suggests skill checks of some kind. They don't need to be randomized, but there does need to be something kind of numerical there, whether it's a threshold or a thing you're rolling against, that those plus ones and minus ones and plus twos can all feed into to have a mechanical impact. That's not necessarily a con because we're talking about role-playing games. And a lot of most of these games have skills that have numerical values. They're tied into either threshold checks or randomized checks. But that is a requirement for the system to really work in this way. Otherwise, you're just doing straight up choice and consequence. It also, more so, I think, than a lot of the other things, it needs UI support to be mechanically player facing. You need to be able to hover and see this thing that you did is directly having a consequence right here. With more abstracted systems, you can say, hey, you just, it's high reputation, low reputation, reputation with Brotherhood of Steel, whatever. It's a little more abstracted. The UI support doesn't need to be quite as robust. There's a little more work that needs to be done. So now the thought cabinet. Very specific and evocative, obviously. Like, it's that's the cool thing about it. Um, even if their reactivity is never externalized, um, if it's just a thought that you have that goes into your head and then you kind of express a little bit outwards, it still feels very satisfying because the dialogue's really good. <laughs> you have a lot of dialogues with your head, with your own thoughts, and it's that's why the game's cool. One of many reasons. Um, the mechanical ties to skills work thematically. So the example I gave before of actual art degree, um, can't even look at this shit, means your perception is lower, and like being furious and lowering, you know, that everything is so shitty and you're just shaking with rage. Those are thematically cool and funny, and it just works really well. And that way, once you complete the thought cabinet, you have an ongoing benefit, so it's not purely narrative, which is cool. Um, it's so specific that externalized reactivity can be difficult, but it's it's internal, so it's not it doesn't really matter. Um, the biggest con is no one can really use it without just straight up ripping off Disc Elysium. <laughs> like, there's a lot of mechanical stuff that we that we can look at and borrow from other games. Sometimes things are so specific to a game, I have a difficult time. Uh, seeing how you could use this without just ripping Disco Elysium. So, thanks. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Uh-oh. Mm, I screwed it up. Sorry, everybody. I forgot how to start from my slide. I'll get right back there. I was almost done. I never deleted it. Oh, well. Almost there, folks. Come along, man. Yes, we did it. We made it. Okay, so general observations on this. Oh, man. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Anyway, so here are my general observations on all this stuff. Um, freedom in role-playing shouldn't be hamstrung by reputation mechanics. So what that means is if there are meta gameplay things associated, for example, vendor prices or things like that, um, I do think that when we make role-playing games, especially ones that are inspired by tabletop, uh, we want to make the range of player expression also have um, be robustly supported on the on the design side, the content. So being neutral reputation or being negative reputation shouldn't feel strictly worse. It should feel different. I think that's what players want. They want they want to feel like their way of playing is rewarded. Um, so the reputation mechanics I don't think should bias a player to heavily meta, they should feel free, if they want to, to role play in the way that they enjoy their character and the world should respond in a way that feels enjoyable. And that can be realistic, but it shouldn't be, I don't think, personally, purely punitive. Um, designers can only write so much stuff. Um, so this is where I started to get wild with Pillars and Deadfire. All that stuff, it's just, it's a lot of things for people to deal with, too much. So be mindful that um, you can create work for people with these mechanics. Um, more reputations don't mean that you get more reactivity. <laughs> They're a tool to trigger more reactivity, but people have to actually make that reactivity. So that's making the system and hooking stuff up. That's, that's part one. Part two is making all the actual reactivity. Sometimes abstraction layers are more work than direct reactivity. So the examples I gave in 
Fallout New Vegas versus Deadfire. The topic system I made, again, high-minded, head up ass, very dumb in practice. Uh, just doing, working out exactly how players would react, or characters would react to each other probably would have been way, way easier and no one would have had to deal with the headaches of tagging topics and debugging all that stuff. Reputation systems should make it easier for designers. Um, it's not, when it starts to become a thing where you are heaping work on them, that they're like scrambling like, oh God, how am I gonna, how am I gonna find a place to react to this stuff? Um, one, then you're really pushing a bunch of new work on designers that can be burdensome for them. And second, when that's the attitude that you're taking, um, it's likely that the content, the reactivity that you're getting, players aren't even going to enjoy. Um, the end goal of all of this is a richer player experience. So whether we do hand-scripted, choice and consequence, reputation-driven, some amalgamation of both, um, it's about making the player experience feel better, like the game responds more to what you're doing in a good way, but simply having a whole bunch of shallow reactions doesn't necessarily make the player experience more enjoyable, it just means that there's more stuff in the game and more is not automatically better. All right, now I'm gonna talk about GDC and why I think it's bad, which is one of the reasons I started to do this talk in the first place. So other than me just screwing it up, this is pretty easy to stream. I mean, here we are. I'm sure there's a bunch of people flaming each other in the chat right now, but otherwise Twitch is not too bad to stream to. All I did is I made sure that there was a little little spot up in the corner here uh, for my head that my slides didn't overlap and then I started streaming. Um, it's going to be easy to upload somewhere else. Uh, the prices that the GDC charges for vault access are absurd. Uh, speakers aren't compensated for their time outside of uh, you'll get a GDC pass for the GDC that you're speaking at and you get one year vault access which isn't inexpensive but it shouldn't be as expensive as it is and they get no travel or lodging expenses. Um, there are a lot of talks all over the world that compensate speakers. They cover travel and lodging and they either stream or they rehost their talks. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and they're a lot smaller than GDC. So uh, they should change their policies or at least tell people why there's any justification for this whatsoever. Until they do, uh, I don't think speakers should give their time to GDC because they're not compensating them for the work that they do. And that is my opinion on that. All right, everybody, that's my talk. And uh, here I am. And uh, wow, 408 people, thanks for showing up, everybody. Um, so I'm here to read your flames. And there's a lot of people in here, so I don't know how I'm gonna be able to respond to all this stuff. But um, let me see. Ooh, ooh. What are my thoughts? So the great Stromboli asked, what are your thoughts on a rep system that allows for granularity within a faction's opinion of you? For example, the faction may generally just like you as a whole, but you can turn some members around. And what about reputation taking actual game time to spread over geography or throughout the group? So this gets into the sort of simulative area, um, which is to say like, Players, there's a certain threshold of plausibility where you're like, oh, that guy didn't get away, I shot him. Like, this guy observed it, but I killed him. Um, I do think, so for example, a game I didn't mention, Kingdom Come Deliverance, I think has a more robust way of dealing with how reputation spreads throughout the world, which is very cool. Um, it's a lot of work to support that. Um, if you think it's worthwhile for your experience, for example, Kingdom Come Deliverance is a very immersive game, and so I think it's appropriate in a game like that to really like try to make it feel as immersive as possible. Um, I don't think it's always necessary. It is a bunch of work. Um, so for example, you gave the faction may generally dislike you as a whole, but you can turn some members around. Again, I think that that is cool, um, but I do think that you have to watch out. Like, what is doing the work? Is it a reputation system or is it a personal sort of tracker? So for example, the NCR hates you, but certain members of the NCR might like you. Okay, that's cool. But you have to think about what the interplay between the mechanical system is and just like how you write the dialogue, how you do the requests. Um, I think it's okay. I think it's cool. Like I think players would appreciate that stuff, but it is more work. I'm gonna see if other people have some questions. Uh, 
Uh, Greg Quisition said, how would you copy or take inspiration from Disco Elysium's dialogues? I do think that the, um, the tag system is really good. It's very, very cool. Um, so thinking about, like one of the things that I really struggled with, um, and one of the reasons I wanted to do dispositions is I didn't like writing dialogue responses or seeing dialogue responses in other RPGs where you're, um, you would make choices and it just felt like there was a throwaway line, even if it was like a really strong thing that the player said, like, yeah, fucking eat shit, you <laughs> And they're like, ah, you crazy kid. Anyway, let me talk about the quest. Um, so I thought it would be nice if there was like some way, some more meaningful way to sort of tally that stuff. And literally that first conversation with Kuno where I saw it, I was like, that's the way to do it. That is the way to do it is to internally track these things and have them uh, be leveraged in mechanical checks. It's like, I literally never thought of it before. I think it's really great. It, it does require you to plan out your dialogues, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think it's really cool. So that's the main thing. I mean, what else to copy about it? Uh, good writing, <laughs> good world development, <laughs> good story. Um, but mechanically, that's the thing that I really like. Mm -hmm. Lucky 9000, shout out to the cats. Thank you very much. They appreciate it. So Beautiful Bear in a Tutu asks, uh, what was the rationale behind using reputation mechanics in Pillars of Eternity? Unlike dispositions, the system felt underused with far too many factions and little reactivity. Outside of reputation being how you start the Radric side quest in Gilded Vale. So I do think that Deadfire used faction reputation much more successfully than Pillars. Part of that is because Pillars of Eternity's factions are only really present, like the, the Defiance Bay factions are present for about a third of the game. And they drop off after Act 2, so that does not feel good. And that was actually one of the first things that we addressed when we were thinking about factions in Deadfire was how can we make sure that factions and faction rep and your interactions with them feel more significant? And it was to tie them more centrally to the through line of the story. Um, yeah, so that's it. I I think that we had intended to use reputation more than we did in Pillars 1. And I think we used it better in Deadfire, accepting all the other garbage that was just too much stuff for people to pick up. Comrade Solar, what do you think about designing second order effects of player reputation affecting faction relationships with other factions? A lot of the times it feels like a PC has a strong reputation with two factions or characters that should somehow influence the relationship between those two have with each other. Um, well, it's I, it makes sense, but again, how complicated are you willing to get with that stuff? Um, we have characters in Deadfire who are faction affiliated. Um, so we have like Maya and Palagina who kind of just from the get-go don't really trust or like each other. Um, they have slightly different attitudes towards each other, but they're very supportive of their respective cultures. And then the player obviously interacts with those directly. Um, we didn't get really gnarly with like all the mechanical interactions of those things. I don't think people thought that the way that Maya and Palagina and the player interacted in the game was worse for it. Um, so yeah, I think you should think about it. I think you should think about hey, is the player going to think that this is weird or doesn't seem appropriate, um, and then work through it? I don't necessarily think you need a repu like um, a new system for that as much as just, you know, like some some gut checks of like, this, this doesn't make sense in this circumstance, so let's make sure that we work around this. <clears throat> All right, I'm... I apologize, I'm not going to be able to answer everything. Again, you can see my Twitter and Tumblr and email down here. Um, so you can you can feel free to talk to me on Twitter or send me things on Tumblr. So I thought at the beginning of this of of I don't I'm not a I'm not a, a fancy Twitch person, so I don't have moderators or anything like that. I apologize if nonsense happened, but there you go. Maybe there's a better platform to stream this on. So I apologize. Uh, question, how do reputation systems deal with intentionalism versus consequentialism in player actions? Gaining karma for rescuing a dog may feel off to a player if they're doing it for a reward, but other people typically judge you based on consequences rather than what you were planning. Well, so, and that's from rcare94. That's a good question. That's one of the reasons why I like 
reputation more than um, karma personally, because reputation is outward facing. So you can, um, you know, like you saved a dog and people are like, wow, what a great, what a great dude. But maybe behind the scenes, you're like, give me the money for this shit. And you're really greedy about it. Um, then those are separate things. So I do think that karma, it's hard because you don't know player intent. Um, I think with reputation systems, whether you're talking about something that's karmic or title-based or general reputation, there's always going to be some level of, of disbelief or how did people find out about that or that's not really what I meant to do. Again, it's an abstraction, so it's it's a tool. And yeah, sometimes tools don't work the way you want them to. So it's you have to be careful with that, I think. Benjamin Stellar Jockeys, hello folks. Um, did you encounter, his question is, did you encounter a common bottleneck in each of your projects regarding reputation systems or did it tend to shift around with each title? Um, the bottleneck tends to be, or not so much a bottleneck, but um, so obviously you wanna have uh, robust systems for tracking. So you have to have a robust script, scripting systems to, to define what the reputations are to increment or decrement the reputations, to check the reputations through scripting. And then the other thing is you should, and I'm very glad we have this at Obsidian, you should have a tool that is able to essentially do the Karma Police work for you of seeing where reputations are being affected in any way or checked. Um, so that way you, you really understand, oh, holy shit, like we're giving 8,000 well, that's an exaggeration. We're we're decrementing, repu uh, we're we're increasing negative reputation 80 times, and we're increasing it 12 in this one area, like increasing positive rep like 12. So you do need something to to pull that. Um, one thing that we've run into is toward the end of the projects, we do have to stop and have someone go through and see where all the reactivity is being incremented, decremented, make sure it's working well, and that's not a bottleneck so much as a um, uh, it's just, it's some work that you have to do late in alpha or early beta to make sure that everything is actually working the way you want it to. Um, I would say that prior to having the script to check where everything was happening, the bottleneck was a complete lack of awareness, um, a complete lack of awareness from, from what was, what was going on. You, you'd say like, oh, I think we're checking rep this many times, but are you, you have no way of knowing. So Wudaba asked, if you were to take another crack at the dead fire system, is there anything you can think of in reflection that would ease the burden on designers while still getting a similar level of reactivity? Um, I would just get rid of the topic system. Like the topic system was probably the most burdensome thing for, for people, uh, for designers. Um, it was a lot of work to set up. It was a lot of work for people to tag things. I would have just, just not done that at all. Um, I do think that having uh, I do think that having a um, sorry I lost my train of thought there. I do think that having sort of maybe topics that you can say like you can call out like oh this player or this character does or doesn't like these topics that's okay. But the whole mechanical system sitting on top of that I just think is unnecessary and it would have I think it would have made all the writers' lives much much easier, including my own because I had to write. I had to write a decent amount of dialogue, not as much as the actual narrative design designers, but I did have to write quite a few. Wandering Tycho, in New Vegas, if you have high Legion rep, you get tons of extra dialogue with Ulysses. Was this done as a way to make up for how shallow Legion stuff was in the base game, or was it just a result of his particular character? Um, so you'd have to ask Chris Avalon for specifics on that, um, but Chris initially conceived Ulysses as a base game Legion affiliated companion. Because that's something he recognized that that was a, a, an absence in the actual lineup of the companions that I had designed. Um, so he designed Ulysses. Unfortunately, things didn't work out. He wasn't able to get it into the base game. But yes, having a pro Legion uh, character was always the intention. Um, as for how he executed that character in Lonesome Road, you'd have to ask him for specifics on that. Sorry, just still checking through the logs here.
So Lancia asks, do you think it's possible to make low global reputation karma feel worthwhile and not just inferior to good karma? Um, the way Baldur's Gate handled this, making evil companions react well to your low reputation feels weird because presumably even evil people want other people to not hate them. Um, yeah, I, I do think that having, I do think that breaking up the reputations a little more is nice. Um, I do think having separate scales of positive and negative is also good because that doesn't just wash out. You can still check things separately. Um, making it feel worthwhile is hard because how do you deal with someone that you have, well, in real life, it's hard to deal with people that you have mixed feelings <laughs> toward. Navigating that is hard. So making reactivity to it can feel very difficult um, to script it. Um, I don't have a great idea for how to write the content, but I would say that, again, separating those reputations um, and having the characters react specifically to things that they care about, uh, that is probably the best way to keep it feeling correct. Um, again, these reputation abstraction systems are supposed to be tools. They're not supposed to be things that you're sort of saddled with. So if rep reputation isn't really doing the job that you want it to do, then you can change the system. You probably shouldn't make it more complicated. But the other thing you can do is you can just sort of handcraft reactivity, and that usually will feel better. Mm. Neurocyst asks, do you think there's room for new development and innovation in tech and tools regarding MPC mechanics and RPG games? Uh, always. Asking as a programmer to help build tools in that area. I will say, if you have not yet seen, and again, I think it's probably right now behind a GDC vault paywall, um, there's a talk that Kerry Patel and Dave Simchek um, from Obsidian gave about OEI tools, Obsidian's uh, dialogue tools, which, in my estimation, are the best branching dialogue tools around. I'm sure there could be some others out there, but I think it's fantastic. Um, but we're always adding improvement to that stuff. Um, one of the things that I actually have been trying to figure out a way to do is I would like in branching dialogues to be able to do, oh man, I can't remember what it's called. There's something on Unreal where basically within a graph, you can just draw a, like a, a big box around a region and say, this is this stuff. So often in a big complicated dialogue, when you zoom out and look at the, the node graph, uh, you, can't, you can't tell what the hell anything is. And especially if you're a new designer coming in to, to look at something, to fix something or add something for another designer, you have no way of navigating that. So being able to say, take 12 nodes of dialogue and put a big box around them and say in big letters, like this is the quest start, or like this is the player romance ending or whatever that is, that's, I mean, it's a minor thing, but like these are workflow things that just help people. There's always like tons of stuff that we can do to make this stuff easier and better. More visibility onto those checks also helps. Shales asks, the idea of companions having relationships among themselves seems interesting. Would you consider PoE2 system a failure of implementation or as a poor concept in general? Um. I think the mechanics were a failure. I don't think it was bad to think about and develop companion to companion relationships. I think the system was the cumbersome thing. Like in my mind, I was like, oh, this will make things easier. And it just, it didn't. So um, I think that, uh, I think that the idea is totally cool and worth doing. Um, but I think it's more about just thinking about, again, thinking about what would be cool how do you think these characters would interact and develop a relationship? What are the means through which that happens? And you're probably just going to hand script it. And I don't think that's a terrible thing. I don't think that's a, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that it's, it's, I think you can do it that way. I think it's totally. Fine. Frederick Vale, all these problems seem in part related to the scale of the game. On more intimate games, fewer faction companions, but with things more screen time, do you think some of these things could work? Or in the end, the problem would be more on the amount of lines in the characters? I do think you're right that the scale of the world does present certain problems. The bigger the world, the more disconnected it feels, the more you kind of have to compartmentalize factions. Um, again, to go back to Disco Elysium, it feels like a very tight and compact world overall, which is great, and those interactions can be much more meaningful. Um, yeah, the bigger the world gets, the more difficult it gets to make that, that stuff feel meaningful, definitely. B 
Beautiful Baron to Tutu, do you think tracking how much time companions spent together and using that as an indicator for when to trigger dialogue between them would have worked better, given it seems like relationships developed along a single track anyway? Um, so that's the thing is that I believe, and in some cases it's true that uh, those things can develop in different ways. It's just that it's so rare for them to develop in different ways that, again, like a lot of the robustness of the system, like meaning the things that it could do were to handle, like so for example, if you, there were like a couple of places where if you avoided certain topics with certain characters, you wouldn't bring up things that would aggravate the other player. And in my mind, I was like, oh, wow, like players are going to catch on to this and they're going to like skillfully, organically steer away from certain topics and conversations. And that that's not really what happened. Um, and I think that, um, I think time spent should certainly be used as a thing. I think there should be other milestones, not just time spent. I think time spent can sometimes feel also, you know, like I'm bringing up this, I'm bringing this up in the middle of a dungeon and it's like, I, cool, nothing, nothing has really occurred that seems like this is appropriate to be reacting to. And this is a really inappropriate place for this to be going on. Um, that's always a risk with abstracted systems. But uh, yeah, again, I think that time spent together certainly sort of been part of how uh, those relationships were evolved. Wookie Leaks, <laughs> that's a good name. Wookie Leaks 83, ain't part of the problem that every new rep system has to exceed the previous one and either improve or innovate the system? But wouldn't it be better just to stick to a simpler system? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think that everything has to be more complex. Uh, I think maybe at the time when we made Deadfire, I did. Not for its own sake, but because I thought that I thought that those systems were necessary. They're not. Um, and again, there is a there is a threshold where adding more complexity isn't making things easier for anyone. It's just adding more work for people. So yeah, I think simpler systems can totally do the work because again, the player the player wants the world and the characters in it to react in a way that is believable and satisfying, and you need to use things to get to that point. If you're not getting to that point, it doesn't really matter. Either the mechanics are bad or you're not using them right. So um, I think a simpler systems can often work great. Um, so this is not really a, uh, this is not really topical, but Mean Jim asks, do you prefer threshold-based or dice-based checks? Um, it's not really about reputation, but I'm going to say I prefer threshold checks for a, a bunch of reasons that I've gone into a million times, but it's worth saying again. Uh, some people like dice roll stuff. I just, I think it has uh, consequences that are not enjoyable often. So Wandering Tycho, for a game with reputation systems, how important do you think it is to have a fail-safe like Yes Man to ensure the game is still completable regardless of player actions? Would it be more of an appropriate result for a player who pisses off everyone to be barred from finishing the game? Um, I think, again, this kind of goes to, this has come up before. Uh, is it realistic? I, sure, like you can see that as realistic. How many players will burn a bunch of bridges and then say, thank you, Obsidian, thank you, game developer, for not letting me complete the game I cannot back out of this. Thank you so much. 10 out of 10, I enjoy this. I'm sure there are some people that think that that's great. Uh, I don't think most players would enjoy that. I do think that's different from sort of false endings or early endings. Like we, we put a bunch, well, not a bunch. We put some of those in Dead Fire where you can screw with usually gods and they just blow you up or turn you into cats or whatever. Um, and then players can go like, ha and they can reload and they can play through a different way. Um, so. I don't think it's strictly necessary. And if you want to make a game that you can just screw yourself out of, you can do that. Um, I usually think though that most people in the audience would not actually enjoy that. Getting into an uh, intractable position, meaning, you know, I can't load up and proceed. I have to load an older save or start the game over. I, I don't think that's fantastic. Okay, I'm going to answer two more questions. So Lund3Thex, maybe it's Lunthex. 
Uh, what should young developers strive to accomplish with their reputations? What philosophy should they hold in mind going forward? I think I mostly dealt with this in the talk, which is it's an abstraction to kind of add up little choices the player makes to give reactivity. So they're a tool to help make it easier to react to a number of things that the player has done. Um, if you're not really using them for that purpose, if you go down the down the dark path like I did, uh, it's probably not going to go super well. So that's that's the high level for it. And then one more question. I'll just see here. Out of all the games you've talked about, what combination of the reputation systems would be ideal for you? Um, I do think that New Vegas had a pretty good balance. Um, I think that the faction reps felt pretty good. I think the companion reputations were dealt with in a pretty streamlined way. Uh, there were flaws and things here and there, but I do think that that worked pretty well. I will say again that like if you took the general, the high level reputation stuff in New Vegas, especially the faction specific stuff, and then you had the tags from Disco Elysium, I think that'd be great. Like I think that'd be really cool because then you can have mechanical reactivity within an individual conversation to choices that you've made. And then you can have your high level reputations for things that you want to carry throughout a faction or a location, which again, if, as long as you don't lean super heavily on it, and make more work for people is cool. Players will enjoy like, oh, wow, yeah, people like me here. They think I'm a big scumbag. So um, that is what I would do. Or, or that's, I'm sorry, I'm not talking straight. That is the combination of stuff that I think would be pretty darn nice for a big open world RPG. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm sorry if there was nonsense in the chat. If I do another one of these things, maybe I'll figure out a better, maybe I'll get moderators or maybe I'll have it on a different uh, platform. This will be up as a uh, video on demand as soon as the stream ends or shortly thereafter. And then um, I'll probably be uploading it to YouTube pretty soon. So thanks for coming by. I hope it was useful. Um, if I didn't get around to answering your questions, uh, you can always reach me on Twitter, Tumblr, and even email. Thanks again. See you.